Welcome to the second lecture on the interstellar medium. In the previous lecture, we discussed the distribution of atomic gas in the interstellar medium. In this lecture, we shall discuss the distribution of molecular gas in the interstellar medium. To appreciate how one detects molecules in interstellar space, one has to first understand how molecules emit and absorb radiation. Let us therefore review what quantum mechanics has to say about this. And let us first start with the various degrees of freedom of the simplest of molecules, namely a diatomic molecule consisting of two atoms. Apart from the translational degree of freedom, the molecule can move around, it can rotate about its axis as shown in the figure. And this leads to a rotational energy and the distribution of rotational energies in quantum mechanics. Let us discuss this now. First, what is the angular momentum of a rotating body? The angular momentum G is equal to I omega, where I is the moment of inertia of the molecule. The rotational energy is half I omega squared or which can also be written as g squared divided by 2i, where g is the angular momentum and i is the moment of inertia. Remember, the kinetic energy of a molecule is half mv squared, where m is the inertial mass and v is the kinetic velocity. Since we are now dealing with rotation, the rotational energy is half g squared over i, where g is the angular momentum of the rotating body and I is the moment of inertia. Now according to quantum mechanics, the square of the angular momentum of a molecule is equal to h bar squared, where h bar is h divided by 2 pi, h is Planck's constant, multiplied by j into j plus 1, where j is known as the angular momentum quantum number. Well, where did this formula come from? Well, if you have studied some quantum mechanics, you will know. Otherwise, you just accept this as a basic principle of quantum mechanics, namely that the square of the angular momentum is quantized and is given by h squared j into j plus 1, where j is the angular quantum angular momentum quantum number and can take on values 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Therefore, if I now substitute this formula for g squared into the formula above for the rotational energy, then I get for the rotational energy of the molecule W is equal to h bar squared divided by 2i multiplied by j into j plus 1, where j can take on values 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Therefore, clearly, the rotational levels are a discrete set of energy levels. And the important thing to appreciate is because the energy levels goes as j into j plus 1, the energy level spacing increases as we go to larger and larger quantum numbers. This is the opposite of the energy levels of a hydrogen atom, which is proportional to 1 over n squared, where n is the quantum number 1, 2, 3, and so on. Therefore, in a hydrogen atom, the energy level spacing decreases as one goes to higher energy levels, whereas for a rotating molecule, the energy level spacing increases. Now, in quarter, according to quantum mechanics, a molecule will absorb or radiate depending on whether it jumps from a lower level to an upper level or whether it jumps from an upper level to a lower level. Now, can a molecule, can all molecules radiate according to this picture? The answer is no. For a rotating molecule to radiate, it has to have a permanent electric dipole moment. Where does this come from? A few lectures down the series, we will be devoting one lecture to radiation from accelerated charges, and there I shall explain this in a little more detail. Right now, you accept this as an axiom, namely, a molecule cannot radiate unless it possesses a permanent electric dipole moment. Now, let us look at the various transitions that can occur. The allowed transitions, according to quantum mechanics, 
has to satisfy this selection rule, delta j is equal to plus or minus 1. Therefore, a molecule from a given level, say j equal to 2, can only jump to j equal to 3 or j equal to 1. It cannot jump from 2 to 0 or 2 to 4. So, delta j has to be equal to plus or minus 1. You just accept this. When a molecule jumps from a level j to say j minus 1 or jumps up from j to j plus 1, what is the frequency of radiation emitted or absorbed? Well, that is given by Bohr's condition. H nu is equal to the energy level spacing delta W between the two levels, the initial level and the final level. And a very simple examination of this formula down below, highlighted in yellow, tells you that the frequency emitted nu is given by a simple formula 2b times j, where b is shorthand for h divided by 8 pi squared i, multiplied by j, where j can take on values 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Where does this b come from? It comes from this factor here. h bar squared is h squared divided by 4 pi, so this factor becomes h divided by 8 pi squared i. Now, the allowed transitions, as I already said, must satisfy the selection rule delta j is equal to plus or minus 1. Now, therefore, the rotational spectrum of a diatomic molecule will consist of equally spaced line with frequencies equal to a multiple of a fixed number b. The frequency will be multiple of a fixed number 2 times b, if you like, multiplied by j. <clears throat> j can be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Let us look at this pictorially. Here are the various rotational levels of a diatomic molecule, j equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And I have shown you the transitions occurring due to when the molecule jumps from 1 to 0, 2 to 1, 3 to 2, 4 to 3, and so on. And according to this formula, the frequency emitted will be given by 2b, 4b, 6b, 8b, and so on, according to this formula, where j is equal to 1, or 2, or 3, or 4. Therefore, the spectrum, which is intensity versus frequency, or wave number, will consist of a series of emission lines equally space and the spacing is given by 2b according to this formula. So please remember the rotational transitions lines will be equally spaced in frequency or wave number. Now what part of the electromagnetic spectrum will this transition lead to emission lines? Well that depends on the value of b which in turn depends upon the value of the moment of inertia which comes in the denominator over there. So let us consider two molecules which are found very often in the interstellar medium, HCl and carbon monoxide CO. Now the mean distance between these molecules is typically 10 to the power of minus 8 centimeters. Now what about the moment of inertia? The moment of inertia of a molecule is sum over mR squared where mi is the mass of the individual atoms and r is the distance of the atom from the center of mass. Now, it turns out that if you work it out, for the HCl molecule, the moment of inertia is 1.7 into 10 to the power minus 40 in CGS units, which will give me a value for B as 10 to the 10, 17, excuse me, 17 centimeter to the minus 1. Therefore, if I consider some transition between j equal to 10 to j equal to 9, that will result in a frequency of 340 centimeter to the minus 1 or a wavelength of 20 microns. Now, 20 microns is in the far infrared. Therefore, <clears throat> the message here is if I consider a molecule like HCl, which is a relatively light molecule because it is hydrogen there, then the rotational transitions will lead to emission lines in the far infrared. What about carbon monoxide, a molecule which is of great importance in astronomy? Now let us consider j equal to 1 to j equal to 0 
transition of the rotational levels of the carbon monoxide molecule, this has a wavelength of 0.3 millimeters or a frequency of 115 gigahertz. This is, of course, in the millimeter wave telescope. Therefore, if you want to detect hydrogen chloride in interstellar space, you need an infrared telescope. And if you want to detect carbon monoxide in interstellar space, you need a millimeter wave telescope and so on. Now, a diatomic molecule can not only rotate about its axis, it can also vibrate about the common center of mass. Now, the, what I have plotted in this figure on the y-axis is the potential energy of interaction between two hydrogen atoms, for example, and the x-axis is the internuclear distance, the distance between the two hydrogen atoms. Clearly, when the distance is very, very large, the atoms are not bound together at all. Therefore, the potential energy of interaction is zero. When you bring the two atoms closer together, at some critical distance, they will start attracting one another. And this is the attractive part of the potential energy. And now when you bring the two atoms really close together so that they are touching against one another, then the repulsion between the electrons will lead to a repulsive potential energy. Therefore, the net potential energy of interaction between two atoms is given by this potential, which is known as the Morse potential. The important thing to appreciate that it is repulsive at very, very short distances. It is strongly attractive, and that is the uh, distance at which the potential energy is maximum and negative. And of course, if the internuclear separation becomes very, very large, the molecule will dissociate. It will break up into two separate atoms. Now, this potential well is clearly something very complicated. As I said, it is known as the Morse potential, which is the red curve shown over there. Now, the thing for you to appreciate is that as long as I am considering this for very small deviations from the equilibrium position, this Morse potential shown in red can be very well approximated by a parabola, which is shown in the blue. Now, parabola, of course, is the potential energy of a simple harmonic oscillator. Therefore, the statement is, as long as the deviation of the internuclear separation is fairly small, then the vibrational frequency, vibration of the two atoms will correspond to a simple harmonic oscillator. And the molecules of, I mean, the energy levels of a simple harmonic oscillator, which is the blue potential energy curve in quantum mechanics, are equally spaced energy levels as shown over there. And this is shown uh, once again in the next picture. So what is shown again is this parabolic potential energy curve, half kx squared, where x is the internuclear separation. This is the parabola. These are the various energy levels. And what quantum mechanics says is that the energy level of a vibrating molecule is given by E subscript n is equal to n plus half h bar omega where n is the vibrational quantum number, and it can take on a value 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So when a molecule <coughs> jumps from an upper level to a lower level, it will emit, and conversely, it will absorb. Or there are selection rules in quantum mechanics. We saw that in rotational transitions, delta j has to be equal to plus or minus 1. Well, there is. In quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics says, that for a simple harmonic oscillator, the selection rule is delta n is equal to plus or minus 1. Therefore, a molecule can only jump to the neighboring vibrational levels. It can jump up or jump down, but only between two neighboring levels. This is strictly true only for a harmonic oscillator. And what is shown on the right are the various energy levels and the wave functions of the various energy levels of a simple harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics, but we shall not digress into that. Now, let us, the story gets interesting now. So here is the potential energy curve of a diatomic molecule. These are the various vibrational levels. They are not equally spaced because this potential is not harmonic, but 
down here the energy levels will be equally spaced and then associated with each vibrational levels or rotational levels there are rotational levels here rotational levels there which i have not bothered to show now transitions can take place between various vibrational levels and various rotational levels and that's what i've tried to indicate on the picture over here now shown in green is the zeroth vibrational state the vibrational quantum number i'm sorry i've changed from n to v because v is more logical for vibration so v is the quantum number of vibration v equal to 0 1 2 3 and so on so this is vibration level 0 this is vibration level 1 these are the various rotational levels j equal to 1 2 3 4 associated with the first vibrational level and these are the rotational levels associated with the second vibrational level now the transitions can occur between all these levels and the selection rule is that delta v can only be plus or minus 1 the v is the vibrational quantum number and delta j can only be plus or minus 0 So let us see now. Let us consider a transition from v equal to one vibrational level to v equal to zero vibrational level, keeping in mind these two selection rules. In particular, the rotational selection rule delta j is equal to plus or minus one. Therefore, from j equal to zero, I can only jump to j equal to one, so I get one emission line. But from j equal to one I can jump to j uh, equal to zero. I mean j equal to two of the lower vibrational level, but from j equal to one of the upper vibrational level, I can also jump to j equal to zero. So you notice that the selection rule here, delta j is equal to plus or minus one, uh, is satisfied. So I get two levels, two lines now. Now let us consider the transition from j equal to two of the upper vibrational levels. I can go from j equal to two to j equal to three. I can also go from j equal to two to j equal to one. Now let us go to the third rotational level of the upper vibrational level. From j equal to three, I can jump to j equal to four, or I can jump from j equal to three to j equal to two, and so on and so on and so on. And that results in a series of equally spaced lines, which I have indicated over there. so the total energy of a vibrating rotating molecule is given by the vibrational energy which is n plus half h bar omega plus h b into j into j plus 1 now as i already said for a realistic potential the harmonic approximation is valid only for the smallest amplitude vibrations the energy levels of an unharmonic oscillator are not equally spaced and this selection rule delta v is equal to plus or minus 1 is strictly valid only for a harmonic potential so as long as i can approximate the real unharmonic potential the morse potential by harmonic parabola then i can use this selection rule delta v is equal to plus or minus 1 but harmonic approximation is pretty good for low amplitude uh, vibrations so what i have shown here is the actual rotational vibrational spectrum of interstellar molecules and what you see unlike in the case of atoms where we had a series of emission lines well separated you have a continuum of emission so the uh, the spectrum of a molecule is a band spectrum it's a series of lines yes but these lines are so equally spaced that unless you look at it in ultra high resolution which is possible only today with electronic detectors it will appear as a continuum now if you look at with a modern day spectrograph say the vibrational rotational vibrational spectrum of carbon monoxide molecule you in fact see series of equally spaced lines as i had shown in the slide 
uh, two slides before. But in the olden days, you could see only a band spectrum of molecules, and it was known as band spectrum for reasons that you just see. But it really consists of um, uh, equally spaced lines, exactly as predicted by quantum mechanics. Now, a molecule can not only move around translational degree of freedom, rotate rotational degree of freedom, or vibrate vibrational degrees of freedom. The electrons in the molecule can also be in various energy levels, just as electrons in an atom can be in n equal to 1, n equal to 3, and so on. Now, what is shown here is the vibrational levels corresponding to the lowest electronic level, and shown above in red is the vibrational level corresponding to the higher electronic level. Now, what is shown in black here are the vibrational levels associated with the lower electronic level, and shown above are the vibrational levels associated with the upper electronic level. Associated with each of these vibrational levels, there will be rotational levels. So a molecule can jump from one electronic level to another electronic level, and while doing so, it can jump from one vibrational level to another vibrational level, and in doing so, can jump from one rotational level to another rotational level. Therefore, you have an incredibly rich emission spectrum and absorption spectrum of molecule. Now, we said that if you are considering molecules of interest in interstellar space, the rotational transitions occur either in the millimeter wave region or the microwave region or in the infrared region. The vibrational spectra of molecules are also in the infrared, perhaps in the far infrared. What about when a molecule jumps from one electronic level to another electronic level? Remember that even in an atom, consider the hydrogen atom, when you jump from n equal to 2 to n equal to 1, the energy level spacing is in the ultraviolet. It's many, many electron volts. When you jump from n equal to 3 to n equal to 2, the energy level spacing is roughly 1 electron volt. It's in the visible region. Now, in the case of molecule, the energy level spacing between electronic levels will be in the ultraviolet region, typically. Therefore, when a molecule jumps from one electronic level, yes, from one vibrational level corresponding to the upper electronic level to some vibrational level corresponding to the lower electronic level, that transition will be in the ultraviolet region. Whereas, if you look at one particular electronic level, then the vibrational transitions shown in red here will be typically in the infrared and the rotational transitions will be typically in the microwave region. If you consider something like a water molecule, then the rotational transitions are in the infrared region and the vibrational transitions will be in the far infrared region. That depends on the moment of inertia of the molecule, how massive the atoms are in the molecule. Now here is a molecular cloud the famous horsehead nebula in the Orion constellation Orion. Now let us now concentrate on, with that background, on the quantum mechanics of the emission and absorption of a simple diatomic molecule. Let us now turn to the interst molecules in interstellar space. The first molecule to be detected in interstellar space was CH and it was discovered by Jean-Pierre Swings and Rosenfeld in 1937, long, long ago. The second molecule to be dis discovered in interstellar space was also a long time ago, 82 years ago, by a Canadian astronomer spectroscopist by name McKellar. He identified three absorption lines of the cyanogen molecule. You see, one absorption line here, one absorption line here, and one absorption line here. Now, against the star, which is Zeta Ophiuchi. Now, this is not the spectrum obtained by McKellar in 1940. This is a modern-day high-resolution spectrum. 
But the point is, even with old and day gratings and uh, prisms and spect old spectrographs, McKellar was able to identify three absorption lines. Not only that, he was able to measure the ratio of the intensity of this absorption line, the ratio of the intensity of absorption line. Please remember the intensity, the depth of the absorption lines depends upon the number of atoms in the lower level. The optical depth depends on that. Now, this led to a very remarkable conclusion, which I shall state now. This ratio of intensities went unnoticed, except by the great spectroscopist Hertzberg, who wrote a famous book on the spectra of diatomic molecule. He wrote a series of books on molecular spectra. The first volume of it is Spectra of Diatomic Molecule. In that, he made the following remarkable statement. He said the ratio of intensities suggested a rotational temperature of 2.3 Kelvin, which of course has a limited meaning. What is this mysterious statement? What Hertzberg was referring to is the following, is that the ratio of intensities of the three absorption lines suggested that the molecule was immersed in a heat bath whose temperature was 2.3 Kelvin. But surely that is nonsense. There cannot be any heat bath of temperature 2.3 Kelvin. But the mark of a good experimentalist is that he or she records what they observe, as long as the result is statistically significant. The significance of this discovery and the significance of this Prussian statement by Hertzberg became clear only 24 years later when the cosmic microwave background radiation was discovered. So when we discuss cosmology and the cosmic microwave background radiation, we shall return to this very remarkable discovery. This was in fact the very first discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation. But that story later on. Let's now proceed. In the late 1960s, Centimeter and millimeter wavelength observations became possible. Centimeter and millimeter wave observations required high frequency electronics and precision reflecting dishes. And that technology became available only in the 1960s and millimeter wave and submillimeter wave telescope were built in several places around the world. And molecules were detected. And what were the molecules that were detected? Hydroxyl, OH, carbon monoxide, ammonia, NH3, and H2CO, formaldehyde, water vapor molecules, H2O, and so on. Now, of these, carbon monoxide is the most important, and it's usually detected through its J equal to 1 to J equal to 0 rotational transition. As I already said, this particular rotational transition occurs at a wavelength of 0 0.3 centimeters or 115 gigahertz. Now, what about hydrogen molecules? After all, hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. Why are we messing around with hydroxyl, water vapor, carbon monoxide? Why not go and detect hydrogen molecule directly? The problem is the following. As I already said, for a molecule to emit or absorb radiation, it must possess a permanent electric dipole moment. Now, let us consider the rotational transition of a hydrogen molecule. Now, hydrogen molecule is a perfectly symmetric molecule. The center of mass is exactly midway between the two hydrogen atoms. And therefore, its electric dipole moment is zero. It can have an induced electric dipole moment, but its permanent electric dipole moment is zero. Therefore, a hydrogen molecule cannot emit radiation by jumping between neighboring rotational levels. Therefore, you cannot hope to see hydrogen molecule through its rotational transition. And therefore, people said, let's observe carbon monoxide. As long as we know, as long as we remember, 
that the most abundant molecule is hydrogen molecule. And as long as we know the ratio of the number of for each carbon monoxide molecule, how many hydrogen molecules are there, then we will be able to determine the true abundance of the interstellar gas. Now, vibrational transitions of a hydrogen molecule are allowed. That is not forbidden by quantum mechanics. But those vibrational transitions are in infrared region and not in the microwave region. And in the 1960s, there was no infrared telescope. Please remember the infrared radiation does not reach the surface of the Earth. It is absorbed by molecules in our atmosphere. Please remember if molecules can emit, molecules can also absorb. So that Atmospheric molecules absorb what is emitted by the celestial molecules, so the radiation never reaches. So you had to put infrared telescopes in orbit above the Earth's atmosphere, and that happened only in the 1980s. Therefore, in the 1960s, you were stuck with microwave observations, and therefore you could not observe hydrogen molecule directly. So one had to be satisfied with carbon monoxide. Well, you say, what about rotation, vibra electronic transition of hydrogen molecule? Well, that happens at even higher frequency, ultraviolet. So you have to wait for the advent of ultraviolet telescope, and that happened only about 20 years ago. Therefore, carbon monoxide was used by radio astronomers as a tracer of hydrogen. One knew from uh, quantum mechanical calculations there would, for every one carbon monoxide molecule, there will be 10 to the power 5 hydrogen molecule. Therefore, by measuring the total number of carbon monoxide molecules, you can deduce the total number of hydrogen molecule in the gas. And detailed maps were made of the distribution of carbon monoxide using millimeter wave telescopes. And I have shown here perhaps the most sophisticated and ultra high resolution map of carbon monoxide emission in our galaxy. And this very detailed map of the distribution of carbon monoxide was made with the 45 meter Japanese millimeter wave telescope at Nobayama with extremely sophisticated uh, low temperature receivers. And please remember that carbon monoxide can have many isotopes. The normal isotope of carbon is carbon-12, but you can also have carbon-13 and you can have carbon-18. Similarly, oxygen, common isotope is 16, but you can have other isotopes of oxygen. Therefore, you could also have various isotopic variations of carbon monoxide. All of these things have been detected. I'm not going to discuss the details of this map at this stage, but I just want to convince you that carbon monoxide is widespread in our galaxy, and through it, we have in fact detected hydrogen molecules in interstellar space. Well, more recently, far, infra, far ultraviolet telescopes uh, are in orbit, and they have been able to detect the vibrational transitions of the hydrogen molecule and also the electronic transitions of the hydrogen molecule. And as for the vibrational transitions which are in the infrared, by late 1970s and early 1980s, infrared telescopes in outer space uh, became possible and therefore one could also detect vibrational transition of hydrogen molecule directly. Now, how is this molecular gas distributed in interstellar space? We saw in the previous lecture, the hydrogen gas is in two components. There is a diffuse hydrogen gas, just as the atmosphere our, uh, of our Earth. And then embedded in this diffuse hydrogen atomic gas, there are discrete atomic clouds. And we detected these clouds as well as the intercloud medium through the 21 centimeter emission. Now, these molecular clouds have been detected through their carbon monoxide emission. And what are their properties? Their particle density is rather large. The particle density of atomic clouds was only about 10 atoms per cubic centimeter. Here you're talking about 100 atoms per cubic centimeter. 
The temperature of atomic clouds was about 100 Kelvin. It was quite warm. But these clouds are incredibly cold. They're only 10 Kelvin. It's a really little higher than the temperature of the universe, which is 2.7 Kelvin. So molecular clouds are very dense and very, very cold. And they're also very large, many light years across, and their masses can be as large as 100 million solar masses. And therefore, they're called giant molecular clouds. They're giant clouds. Not surprisingly, when atoms come together to form molecules, the molecules come together to form grains and dust grains are ubiquitous in molecular clouds. And it is for this reason that molecular clouds are opaque to visible light. How are these giant molecular clouds formed? Well, the details are not clear, but they are predominantly found among the spiral arms of our galaxy and external galaxies. And we shall discuss this when we discuss the spiral structure of galaxies in a later lecture. We said that the atomic gas is distributed rather diffusely it has a temperature of about 10,000 Kelvin and the number density of about 0.1 hydrogen atoms per cubic centimeter. And embedded in this are atomic hydrogen clouds with the properties that are indicated over there. Embedded in this intracloud medium are also giant molecular clouds whose temperature is only of the order of 10 Kelvin and whose masses are can be as large as 100 million solar masses. Now, according to this picture, there are either atomic clouds or there are molecular clouds. Why don't we have, do we have clouds which are a 50-50 mixture of atomic clouds and molecular clouds? The answer is no. And the reason is very simple but extremely interesting. Now, here is an atomic cloud, a small cloud, and here is a giant molecular cloud. H2 and H. Now in the interstellar medium, new stars are being born. New stars are very, very hot and they emit ultraviolet radiation. The more massive stars among them live for a very short time. As we will see, in about 10 or 15 million years, they explode as a supernova explosion. And this explosion results in a shock wave and X-ray and gamma ray emission. So these Hydrogen clouds and molecular clouds, atomic clouds and molecular clouds are bathed by high frequency radiation, ultraviolet radiation and X-ray radiation from supernova, blast waves, ionization fronts and so on. So let's look here for example. These hard photons will first break up the molecule into two hydrogen atoms. So what we'll have is a thin layer of dark blue region, which is hydrogen atom. In the interior, you have hydrogen molecule and you have a thin skin of hydrogen atoms. Why don't the photons go further in? Because they have already been used up by the hydrogen molecules and they have dissociated the hydrogen molecules to hydrogen atom. Then further hard photons ionize the hydrogen atoms that is shown as the cyan blue over here. So what you will find is when you're dealing with a very large giant molecular cloud of about 10 to the 8 solar masses, most of it will be molecular. There may be a thin blanket of atomic hydrogen and ionized hydrogen surrounding it. In the case of an atomic cloud, in the beginning, you will only have a thin layer of ionized gas, but over a period of time, this small cloud will be fully ionized and the atomic cloud will just disappear. How are giant molecular clouds formed? Now, atomic clouds form spontaneously in the interstellar medium, just as the clouds in our atmosphere form spontaneously and the reasons are to be found in thermodynamics. Now these atomic clouds have random motions, as I already, as, uh, in, as, as we will discuss in, in the subsequent lecture when we discuss galaxies. These atomic clouds are being kicked around by supernova shock waves. Therefore, 
These atomic clouds, in addition to going around the center of the galaxy, also have random motions because they are being kicked around by supernova blast waves. And this can cause collisions of clouds. And these collisions lead to coalescence of atomic clouds, an increase in the number density of hydrogen atoms and the probability of molecular formation. And thus, giant molecular clouds are formed. Where do such collisions occur? Where are they likely to occur? We will discuss that in a subsequent lecture. But atomic molecular clouds are destroyed by hard radiations. Atomic clouds just evaporate away. And molecular clouds, when they are hit by supernova blast wave and ionization front, collapse in the periphery and that results in the formation of new stars. But something very interesting happens. The, the offsprings of the giant molecular clouds, newly formed hot massive stars, are rather ungrateful. They emit strong ultraviolet radiation or they explode and emit X-rays and gamma rays, which results in the destruction of the parent molecular cloud. Now, because the molecular cloud contains a lot of dust particles, they are opaque to visible light. Therefore, these holes in the heavens, as Sir William Herschel said in 1873, if, my, if I got the date wrong, are really not holes in the heavens. They are giant molecular clouds and they are opaque to visible lights. You can't see the stars through them because of obscuration by dust. And it is this dust that caused the extinction that made the distant clusters of stars dimmer than they ought to be according to inverse square law. And of course, you can see these dark clouds, but you have to wait, one had to wait till the advent of millimeter wave astronomy and infrared astronomy to directly see these clouds in emission. In visible light, they are just opaque. Now here is a section of a small molecular cloud. Now here are two pictures of a well-known galaxy, an external galaxy, a two wavelength. What is shown on the right is the image of this galaxy in visible wavelength. And what we see in the visible wavelength of this M51 known as the Whirlpool Galaxy are dark lanes which tells you the distribution of dust. So dust is distributed along the spiral arms. And I just claim that these dust clouds really consist of molecules. Now, if this is really true, then these clouds must emit radiation in the microwave and one ought to be able to detect it in carbon monoxide, J equal to 1 to J equal to 0 transition. And you do indeed see. What you see on the left is the image of the same galaxy taken with a millimeter wave telescope. And what you see is that the carbon monoxide gas which is a tracer of hydrogen molecular gas, precisely traces the spiral arms, which you see as dark lanes in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now here is some, yet another galaxy, and what you see in blue, blue is of course a false color uh, done by computer uh, imaging, and what you see in blue is the carbon monoxide emission. And if you were to see it in infrared, you will in fact see this molecular gas in the infrared also. Now, if you look with a modern day infrared telescope, straight towards the center of our galaxy, this is what you see. You see the infrared radiation and you see that the infrared radiation which comes from molecular cloud is confined essentially to the plane of our galaxy. Previously, uh, we had, in the previous lecture we said, the atomic gas, the diffuse atomic gas, the intercloud medium and the diffuse atomic clouds are distributed above and below the galactic plane with a scale height of about 350 light years. 
so the total thickness of about 700 light years. But the dust lanes which are seen in the infrared, which represent molecular clouds, are a much thinner layer whose scale height is only about 180 light years or about 60 parsec. One parsec is three light years. <clears throat> As I said, molecular clouds are birthplaces of stars. Here you see the edge of a molecular cloud and you see this beautiful cluster of blue massive stars that have recently formed. <clears throat> now collapse of molecular clouds results in star formation. That we know for sure because we this is what observation tells us. The details of how molecular cloud collapses and how stars form and why individual stars don't form but a cluster of stars form, the details are not clear. But what is clear that this collapse of the molecular cloud is triggered by supernova blast waves, expanding ionization fronts and so on. These stars emit in the ultraviolet because they are hot and massive. The, their black body spectrum peaks in the far ultraviolet and so they eat away the clouds. These stars live for a very short time, 10, 12 million years, and they explode as a supernova blast wave which eats away these clouds. Now when stars form, they form in clusters and each cluster, although the stars, all the stars in the cluster are of the same age, they are of different masses. Now here is another molecular cloud and what you see at the periphery of the molecular cloud <clears throat> a cluster of newly formed stars and the ultraviolet radiation ionizing the gas around it <clears throat> which is emitting recombination radiation which we discussed in detail in the previous lecture. Here you see a more uh, a different uh, image of the same newly formed cluster of stars in the Rosette Nebula. Here is yet another picture. This is just to indicate that the mean distance between the stars and the cluster, newly formed cluster is roughly of the order of one light year. Now the ultraviolet radiation from the newly formed massing stars, massive stars will break up the molecules, ionize the neutral hydrogen gas, and it will emit recombination radiation whose characteristic wavelength will tell us about the composition of this gas. Molecular clouds, collapse of molecular clouds triggered by supernova blast waves and ionization fronts results in star formation. Now according to the picture that I showed just two, two slides earlier, these clusters of stars are just near the outer boundary of the molecular cloud. Therefore, the newly formed stars are like blisters on the surface of molecular clouds. You know what I mean by blisters. If you're playing tennis, you develop blisters in your hand, or if you're wearing a new shoe, you develop blisters in the sole of your foot. So these newly formed clusters of stars are at the very edge of molecular clouds. They are like blisters. Now, these stars will trigger further star formation because the ionization radiation results in further compression of the molecular gas and the supernova blast waves coming due to the collapse of these stars result in further compression of the molecular stars. Therefore, there will be a chain of star formation. And in the process, the cloud is slowly whittled away. And this I have tried to show in this picture. This is what you actually see. The edge of a giant molecular cloud, a newly formed cluster of stars. It has eaten away the molecular cloud over here and it is ionizing the gas over here, which you see in recombination radiation. And that's what I have tried to show in this cartoon. You have a giant molecular cloud and you have a new cluster of newly formed stars. Now, if this picture of successive generation of star formation is true, then you should find 
Further back in time, somewhere over here, you should find a cluster of stars, which is older. And further to the left, you should see an even older cluster of stars. An older cluster of stars will be larger because the stars clusters expand. So this is what you expect to find in this scenario of serial or sequential star formation triggered by supernova blast waves and ionization front. You should find clusters of stars in a straight line aligned with the giant molecular cloud with the oldest cluster here, a middle-aged cluster there, and the youngest cluster there. And I'm happy to say that this is exactly what observations uh, tell us is happening. Now, the visible radiation when you look at external galaxies is mostly from massive stars. Remember that the luminosity of a star is proportional to the cube of the mass, or m to the power 3.5. Therefore, what you're really seeing in an image like this are really the massive stars. You don't see the individual stars, you see the clusters of stars. And you also see the gas which is ionized by the cluster of stars. So what you see in visible light are really clusters of stars and ionized hydrogen regions. And also the molecular clouds are seen as dust lanes. Now what you see here is the Andromeda galaxy in the far infrared. In the far infrared, you don't see the st stars, you see only the newly formed stars as well as the dust clouds. And you see that the newly formed stars as well as the dust clouds do indeed trace the spiral arms exactly as we see in the other galaxy. So the whole picture fits together very, very beautifully. Now let us quickly summarize what we have said in the previous lecture as well as this lecture. Here is a quick summary. <coughs> Excuse me. The region between the stars is filled with diffuse gas as well as clouds of gas. The diffuse gas is predominantly neutral hydrogen. <clears throat> it is warm and tenuous, optically thin, and it is seen through its emission at 21 centimeter. It does not absorb very much 21 centimeter radiation. Its temperature is about 10,000 degrees and the number density is about 0 0.1 hydrogen atom per cubic centimeter. Embedded in this diffuse medium are clouds of gas. These clouds of gas are either almost entirely atomic with an admixture of heavier elements, carbon, oxygen and so on, as you would expect. And then there are other clouds which are almost entirely molecular in nature. The atomic gas clouds are warm, about 100 Kelvin, and fairly diffuse, only about 10 atoms per cubic centimeter, whereas the molecular clouds are much denser and very much colder. The atomic hydrogen clouds are seen both in emission as well as absorption. In the 21 centimeter radiation, which results when a hydrogen atom in the ground state jumps from the upper hyperfine state to the lower hyperfine state. Now, these clouds are in pressure equilibrium with the intracloud medium. This is the raisin pudding model. The pudding is the intracloud medium, and the raisins are the atomic cloud. The emb embedded in this intercloud medium are also giant molecular clouds, which were first detected in the 1960s onwards using millimeter wave telescope at frequency of 115 gigahertz or even higher frequencies. The 115 gigahertz transition is a transition from J equal to, this is written wrongly, from J equal to 1 to J equal to 0 emission of the rotational levels of the carbon monoxide molecule. <clears throat> although, carbon, although the giant molecular clouds are made mostly of molecular hydrogen, 
since rotational transitions are forbidden for a hydrogen molecule because it does not possess a permanent electric dipole moment, carbon monoxide is used as a tracer of these giant molecular clouds. Let me remind you once again that for every one carbon monoxide molecule, there are roughly 10 to the power 5 hydrogen molecules. Therefore, one can deduce the density of molecular hydrogen from observations of carbon monoxide. Both atomic clouds as well as molecular clouds are found along the spiral arms of galaxies. The dynamical collapse of the giant molecular clouds leads to the formation of clusters of stars. This collapse is triggered by the compression of the giant molecular cloud by ionization fronts from hot young stars as well as by shock waves from the explosions of massive stars. We shall revisit this topic when we discuss spiral structure of galaxies three lectures from now. Consequent to what I have said just now, gaseous nebulae such as this are excited by ultraviolet radiation from newly formed hot stars are to be found near the outer regions of the giant molecular cloud. And that's exactly what you find. What you find here, this is the great nebula in Orion. At the outer edge of the giant molecular cloud in Orion. And this ionization nebula is caused by these newly formed stars at the center of the great nebula in Orion. So that is the summary of the interstellar medium. Now we move on to the next unit of lectures. And the next unit of lectures, which will consist of three lectures, will be on galaxies. And in the next lecture, we shall discuss the realm of galaxies. Thank you very much.